when I hear that song, the words I think of are, it is finished. I think those are two of the most, or three, of the most powerful words ever spoken, right? It is finished. They're certainly exciting words, and they're even exciting for us to say, don't you think? Have you been working on a hard project, and then all of a sudden you get to say, it is finished? Oh, that feels so good. That feels so good to be able to say, it is finally done. I am done. All you husbands out there can look at your wife and say, I'm done, and she can say, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not quite done yet. I, I was walking through Lowe's one time for my lovely wife. It's been a while. This was when we lived over in Prineville. And I had a whole bunch of stuff in my cart. And the guy walked past me. And this was when, when Pinterest first started becoming a big thing. And she liked Pinterest. And if any of you have wives that like Pinterest, you know Pinterest was the source of a lot of your pain. And I was walking through Lowe's and this guy looked at my cart. And he looked at me and he's like, that looks like a Pinterest project from a not so nice place. And I said, I think you're right. So I went home and I was making this, it was like an old, it was like a barn door thing. And it had all these, you know, because you can't make it simple. It's got to have all these little designs with the wood and it's got to be cut at angles. And, and so, I, well, first of all, I was proud that she thought I could do it. That was the first thing. So then, of course, my man pride says I have to. So I started to. And after hours and hours of crawling around on the cold garage floor, gluing and cutting and recutting and probably making four or five more trips back to Lowe's to buy more stuff because I screwed up so many times. But finally, I got to get it done and got to say, it is finished. And it was an amazing feeling. And then when she said she liked it, it was an even more amazing feeling. So we know how good of a feeling it can be when we say that the project is done that it's finished. Well, today in Nehemiah chapter 6, we get to read those very words from Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets to say, folks, it's done. It's finished. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, it says, so on October 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. 52 days later, it's done. So, the wall was finished. And if you have been following this series and reading through Nehemiah, and you know what that so involves, right? Right? That one word really puts this whole thing into perspective. So, after we had to fight all of the enemies that wanted to stop us, after Nehemiah had to wait months for God to answer his prayer as he had this passion and desire for these broken and lost people in this, well, this broken down wall. So after we waited for all of that, so after we took a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other, so after we had to watch each other's back, so, oh, that's right. And then once we had to stop taking advantage of each other and deal with our own internal problems, so after all of that... In just 52 days, we finished the good work that God called us to do. How exciting of a day that must have been for Nehemiah and for the people. And they must have just thrown the shovels away. They were exhausted and they were tired. I mean, this was 52 days, less than two months to rebuild a wall. I was trying to find some figures on how big this wall was and, and where it went. And there's all kinds of debate about how big it was. But it looks like it was, if you were to stretch it out, somewhere around two or three miles long. And we aren't talking about a little fence, you know, with a couple posts and you string some wire up. We're talking about a wall, several feet wide you know, tall enough to be considered a wall, one rock at a time. No heavy equipment, one rock at a time to rebuild this wall, to build the gates, to hang the gates, all of these things just short of two months in the face of all this opposition. So the wall was finished. And you know what a finished work does to the enemy? 
scares them to death. I love what Nehemiah says after this. So when our enemies heard about what had happened and how we had finished the wall in 52 days, it says they were frightened and humiliated. The NIV translation says they lost all of their confidence. For all of this time, they had been fighting against God's people, trying to get them to stop, trying to stop God's work, trying to get them to stumble, trying to to pull them off track. And after 52 days, they stand there and said, you couldn't stop us. And it's testimony to the power of God in their life and a testimony to the power of God at work in the world. And it says they realized this work had been done with the help of God because these people really didn't have the resources, the skill, or the knowledge. They really didn't know what they were doing, but by the grace of God, they did it anyway. And they accomplished an insurmountable task with God's help. And that finished work brought all the glory to God. And gave them a tremendous testimony to share and was a light for the world. Had they not finished the wall, we wouldn't be talking about Nehemiah today. Because Nehemiah would have just been another guy that went to Jerusalem to try and get them on track and well, they didn't. But that's not the story we have. The story we have is so the wall was finished and the people, the enemies realized how big God was. I want you to think about the work that God has called you to do. Or I want you to think about the work that God has said he's going to do in your life. And I want you to think about the so that you have. So you have all these obstacles. So you have all these excuses. So you have all these distractions. So you have all this doubt. So you have all this worry. Fill in that so. And think about how good it's going to feel when you can say so it was finished. So it was finished. So God did what he said he was going to do. The good work that God started in me, he saw it through to completion. When he said he would never leave us or forsake us, turns out he actually meant it. And today we get to live in that victory and we get to celebrate that finished work. God isn't going to call you to a work he doesn't want to finish. God isn't going to begin to do a work in you he's not going to finish because not only does he know how important it is for you, he knows how amazing testimony that is and how bright of a light that is to the world and it declares his power and his sovereignty and his majesty. When the rest of the world can look at you, can look at us and say those people just did something amazing, it had to happen because God was with them. It had to happen because God was behind them. That person's life has been totally transformed, and it was only God that was able to do that. A finished work gives amazing testimony to the power of our God. So don't ever think that if God's called you to something, it won't be finished, because God will finish it. And he will give you a testimony of that completed work. And so Nehemiah has it. He has that testimony. The the power of God is on display. And so I want us today to look at Nehemiah chapter 6 and basically ask the question, how did you do that? We've kind of been looking at that all along the way and painting this picture. but, But Nehemiah, how did you do that? Because the attack of the enemy didn't stop. And as we'll see in here in chapter 6, it just changed tactics. And that's how he works in our life too. When one thing doesn't work, he tries something else. When this question or this doubt doesn't work, doesn't doesn't pull us off track, well, he attacks us from another angle. It just never stops. And that in itself can be overwhelming and frustrating. But if we can just, just hang on to that day when we get to say it's finished, and we get to look at God, and God gets to look at us and say, well done. Like when I looked at Des and I showed her the barn door, and she said, good job but could you make it this color? No. She didn't say that. Well, she sort of did. But look at Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3. The first thing that Nehemiah has done, and we've seen him do it over and over and over again throughout the beginning of this book, is he was able to stay focused, laser focus, in light of all of this opposition and in light of all of the temptation and distraction to go a different direction. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Nehemiah replied by sending this message to them, I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? So what's happening here is that Nehemiah had an invitation to go and meet with some other leaders, the very leaders that had been trying to stop him all along the way. 
And so now he's being invited to come and meet with them. And, and, and that's an easy distraction. We see that Nehemiah, all throughout his time in Jerusalem, is able to look kind of through the surface or beyond the surfacey stuff and get to the heart of what's happening. And Nehemiah, in this laser focus, was not deterred at all in any, any fashion as he went along this way. He wasn't deterred by time. How long? Months before God answered his initial prayer. Months went by, focused. Enemies came in and said, you can't do this, you're too weak. He's focused. And now all of a sudden some kings come in and they say, why don't you come meet with us because we've seen that you've done it. I mean, this was a temptation. This sounded like a good concession speech if you want to, to go that direction. But he saw past all of it, and he stayed focused on his task. Look at what he said. He says, I'm engaged in a great work. I don't have time to deal with you. I don't have time for this. There are so many things in this life that are going to try and pull us off track and take our focus that we have got to learn to say, I don't have time to deal with you. I don't have time for this. It's not worth it. If I give you my time and my attention, then that means I'm not going to be able to give the good work God's asking me to do my time and my attention. And my time and my attention and my focus has to be on that good work. Or what am I doing? Why am I doing it? We've seen it happen. We've seen leaders, pastors fall off track because they lost focus of the thing that God had called them to do, forgetting the good work. We've seen entire movements die because the leaders in that movement got distracted. We ourselves have fallen prey to these tactics and fallen into temptations and found ourselves in sin having to crawl our way back to the road that God had placed us on because we allowed ourselves to get pulled off track. And if there's ever been a time in our history where we've had to stay on our toes and been intentional about our focus and been intentional about who we're looking towards and who we're, we're looking out for and what we're listening to and who's directing our path, today's that day. Because there is so much out there through all kinds of avenues the, the internet and social media has just brought so much information to us that if we aren't focusing on Christ and Him alone, we are easily going to be taken off track. We have got to have laser focus, just like Nehemiah. And we have got to say to all the other things in our life that are going to try and ask for our attention, I don't have time for that. I've got to stay focused on Christ. I've got to stay focused on His truth. I've got to stay focused on the work that He's called me to do or the work that He's doing in me. I don't have time to listen to this other nonsense. We've got to be willing to say that. We've got to be willing to say, nope, not going to happen. And so as we embark on this journey of Christ-likeness or to live in Christ today, to be a light in the dark world, to love our neighbor, neighbors, to make disciples, all of those things, we are going to have to make sure, just as Paul tells us all throughout the New Testament, that we have fixed our eyes on Christ. We hear that over and over and over again from a man who could have easily been distracted by his own, uh, his own success, his own titles, his own achievements. But over and over, Paul tells us, fix your eyes on Christ. Run that race with endurance, keeping your eye on the prize, right? Over and over and over again, we are told to keep looking toward God and stay focused. Nehemiah was invited by some world or some, some regional leaders to come and speak with them. And he was able to say, nope, that's not the work I'm about. I've got to stay here. When we are confronted with those distractions, that's the other thing Nehemiah was able to do, is he was able to discern when to say yes and when to say no. We are going to have to figure out there are times in our life when some things are going to look good and look like things we should say yes to and look like things that are actually going to benefit us. But we've got to trust the leadership of the Holy Spirit. We've got to trust our focus on Christ and be willing to say no. 
Nehemiah is invited by these other guys to come and talk to them. You know what it sounds like they're doing on the surface? A concession speech, like I said. They were going to congratulate him on a job well done. Dude, we tried to stop you. We couldn't. Good job. Come be a part of our group. Come be a part of our, our, little, our little gang and, and all things will be well and we'll get to get along and it'll be great. It sounds very advantageous to Nehemiah to go for the city of Jerusalem's leader to go and meet with these other leaders. It sounds good. What could go wrong with that? But Nehemiah saw through it. They were just going to get rid of him. They didn't really want to encourage him or congratulate him. They saw, he saw right through all of that. And so when we are in this world, we're being bombarded with all of this stuff. Hey, come talk to me. Hey, come listen to me. Hey, come follow this path. Hey, come do this. Hey, come do that. We've got all these things whispering in our ears, these memes and these posts and these TikToks and this and that all over the place, trying to entice us away and to get us distracted. And hey, come do this. And sometimes we're going to go, man, that looks pretty good. What's the harm in following that? Oh, that, look, that, that, that looks pretty good. Maybe I could listen to this for a while. Man, I don't know. Maybe I can follow this. We, we've got all these things, and on the surface, they look good. But we've got to be discerning, and we've got to ask God to give us some, some clarity in these things. Because just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. Nehemiah, it, doesn't look, it looked good, but it's not good. No. What do we need to say no to? Even if it looks good, I, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that Satan wanders around masquerading like an angel of light. You know what the enemy's good at? Making sin look good. Nobody, anybody here ever go and commit sin or find themselves struggling in sin because it was unattractive and looked bad? No. In a previous ministry, I once had somebody stand to give testimony about how God had freed them from their addiction. And this guy was super vulnerable and honest, and he looked at a group of young people and he said, I'll be honest with you, I started using drugs because it felt good. And my first instinct was, <gasps> what is happening? But he's right. We don't do stuff because it feels bad. We do stuff because we find benefit in it. We give in to sin and temptation. We follow these distractions. We listen to these voices because we see some good in it. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Sin can be tempting and alluring. Nehemiah found this opportunity, I'm sure, to be very tempting. But as he had this constant communication with the Father, he was praying all the time. He was able to discern the, the heart of it and how false it was. We've got to be a people of discernment. We've got to be willing to say no even to the things that look good. We've got to be willing to say, I don't have time for that. I've got to stay here. Are we going to get it right every time? Absolutely not. Am I telling you to be a cynical person that thinks all good things are bad? I hope not. That's not what I'm saying. But what we have to do is be willing to follow the Lord and to say no, even when everybody else is telling us to say yes. Nehemiah was able to stay focused. Nehemiah was able to say no. Nehemiah listened to God long before he ever listened to the lies. In Nehemiah 6, verses 10 and 12, it says, Later I went to visit these two guys and a grandson. <laughs> yep, I skipped their names. Who was confined to his home. He said, let's meet together inside the temple of God. This guy's a false prophet, by the way. He says, let's meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Interesting. Uh, your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Hello, they've been trying to kill us for the last 52 days. Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me uh, because these guys had hired him. This is the truth. Look at how it's wrapped up all nice and pretty. Well, it's not a bad thing to go to the temple. And certainly I should want to save myself. I don't want to die. I'm these people's leader. I've got to stay alive to lead the way. Like, it all looks good. 
But we've got to listen to God before we listen to man. If we find ourselves listening to man before we listen to God, we're going to be in the temple with the doors bolted shut, waiting for an angry mob that's never going to show up. And we're going to lose all opportunity to lead a city to redemption, to lead a city into health and wholeness in Christ. We're going to lose all effectiveness because we're hiding in a temple with the doors bolted shut. There's a whole sermon in that. But we can't be running and hiding because we're listening to a human. We've got to be running and facing whatever danger may or may not be there because we're listening to God. We've got to be discerning. We've got to listen to God before we listen to man. And perhaps the most important thing that Nehemiah did in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 9 in the midst of all of this increased turmoil, he prays a simple prayer. Oh God, Strengthen my hands. O oh God, strengthen my hands. The lies are coming. The threats are coming. I mean, and I'll tell you, it gets exhausting trying to be discerning all the time, trying to figure out when to say yes, trying to figure out when to say no, especially if you're a people pleaser. It gets exhausting. And Nehemiah simply says, God, strengthen my hands. He was able to complete this work and see this work to to completion because he depended on God to strengthen his hands. He depended on God to strengthen the hands of the people. He depended on God to fight for them. He depended on God to protect them. He depended on God to give him the resources to rebuild the wall in the first place. He depended on God to give him discernment, to know when to say yes and when to say no. It wasn't at all about Nehemiah, his abilities, or the people's abilities. It was all about God strengthening his hands. All throughout Psalms, David reiterates the same thing. David is this man who who was called to be a king. That was his good work. But Saul stood in the way. David's hiding in caves, running for his life. And he writes psalm after psalm, God, you are the source of my strength. You are my refuge and my present help in trouble. It's all about how much we depend on God and not on ourselves? Do we trust God to strengthen our hands when we need him to? Do we trust God to fight for us, to protect us, to be there for us? Do we trust him to be our refuge and our strength and our present help in trouble? And at the end of all of that, here's what I truly believe. If we are able to stay focused, if we say no to the things that we need to say no to, If we continue to trust God above all else, we will be able to stand one day and say, so it was finished. So I have victory today. So I've been forgiven. So I've been changed. So I've been transformed. So my family's been redeemed. So my city has been saved. My city has been redeemed. So so things have changed so drastically and so quickly. It's been amazing to see how this happens. Here lately, I have really begun to have a really big burden for Portland and for the things that are happening. I've attended some, some city council meetings and even had an opportunity opportunity to speak for a whopping two minutes at one of them. But there's things happening in our city that we could easily run from, ignore, and and maybe there's instances where we should get out of the way or the mess, but there's also time where we need to stand our ground as the church in Portland and rebuild a wall, not literally, But begin to live for Christ in a place where there is darkness and chaos, just like Nehemiah did. And if we stay focused in the midst of the chaos, and despite what everybody else is saying, maybe the church in this city can stand one day and say, so it's finished. God has done a work of revival and redemption, yes, in the streets of Portland, in a northwest city that isn't known for its being religious or churched. Maybe God can work beyond the walls of a church 
that isn't running and hiding and bolting themselves in, but instead invading the darkness and the chaos with the love of Christ, just like Nehemiah has a passion to see a broken people redeemed for the sake of God, allowing God to lead the way and take and provide the resources needed to see revival happen. As I've just personally been challenged to believe for bigger things, for not just little old central, but for all of Portland, to believe God can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. A few years ago, we, we talked about how we were going to take the hill and we were going to claim this place for Christ. It's happening. It's happening. God is at work in people's hearts and lives all over the hillside and all over the community. It's messy. We have broken windows to prove it. But Nehemiah is walking around with a shovel and a sword. So if you have a shovel and a sword or a, or a, a broom and a piece of glass... Maybe you're in the right place. Maybe we're where we need to be. And if we stay focused and we keep moving forward and when we feel exhausted and tired, just simply say, God, strengthen our hands. One day we will be able to stand and say, so after 52 days, it's finished. I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God today. I don't know what God is tugging on your heart about. I don't know what God is whispering in your ears saying, that's the work I want to do in your life, or that's the work I want to use you for. Uh, you and God know what he's saying to you today. Don't push him aside. There's all kinds of other things in your life that you need to push aside. There's all kinds of other things that you need to say no to. I want all of us to say yes to him today. Say yes to whatever it is he's asking of you. Say yes to allowing God to do a work of transformation in your own heart and life. Say yes to allowing God to use you to do things you never thought you could imagine. Say yes to allowing God to use you to pursue the things that you're passionate about. Say yes to those things. Look, Nehemiah said yes and he transformed a city. One man said yes to God and led an entire city to rebuild a wall and unite together under their identity in God. One man. Can you imagine what God would do if an entire city of followers of Christ said, yes, whatever you want, God, I'm going to stay focused, I'm going to say no to all the distractions, and I'm going to allow you to lead the way and give me all the strength I need to do what you're asking me to do today. What a day that would be. It would be more than a barn door. I can tell you that. It would be amazing to see the body of Christ come together and do the work God's called us to do. It would be amazing to see you personally surrender yourself to God and allow God to do the work in you that God wants to do. And we have a God who is faithful and has promised that whatever he starts, he'll finish. And he wants to finish that work in you and do that work through you today. So why don't you stand to your feet this morning. And God, what are you asking of us today? What are you asking of us? God, what, what in our life has distracted us from your truth what in our life has pulled us away from listening to you? What, what distractions, even as good as they might sound, do we need to say no to today? Give us the boldness to say no. God, look, guide us back on track if we have fallen off. Get us back in line with you, Lord God. Help us to refocus God, what do we need to say yes to today? What work of transformation do we need to allow you to do in, in us? And what good work are you calling us to do that we need to say yes to? God, we know that you are a big God capable of big and mighty things. We know you can change and transform entire groups of people. We know that you can save and transform cities. We know, God, that you can transform and save each and every one of us. 
So God, today I'm praying right now for everybody that is here in person, everybody that is online, that God, we say yes to you. Maybe it's the first time we've ever said yes to you and we're beginning that relationship with you for the very first time. God, we rejoice in that. It is finished. Another soul won. Another, another member of the family. God, we praise you for that. God, maybe we started off months ago, years ago, saying yes to you, but we've gotten ourselves off track because we started saying yes to things we shouldn't have said yes to. God, today we repent. God, forgive us of losing our focus. But yes, God, I want to come back. I want to be with you again. God, whatever work that you're calling us to do, individually and corporately, God, we say yes. Use us to do big and amazing things, to lead people to you. Just, God, we're, do a work in us this morning. Make a way where there is no way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.